others as a mirror of ourself. Perhaps you've heard of this concept. It's certainly a concept that has been written about in many different cultures, many different religions, philosophers, and spiritual teachers. And so in this video, I want to go over four different ways I've interpreted that and how that relates to our life in a practical sense. My name is Jennifer Van Wyk, and I am a psychotherapist, a humanitarian, and a best-selling author. And this video is all about how others are a mirror of ourself. So first, I see others being a mirror of ourself as, as kind of reflecting this idea that our beliefs and thoughts will create a different world for each person. Uh, in psychology, you learn all about how one event will happen and each witness to that event will have a different view, a different testimony, a different experience of that event. And I've certainly seen that when I go into disasters. There's so many different reactions to the same disaster. Uh, this is especially true, we see this actually in everyday life in terms of stereotypes our minds are inherently lazy, right? So we like to just group things in different categories and we don't wanna think more than necessary. So stereotypes really help us streamline our day-to-day -day lives. However, what happens is when we have an idea about something or a belief about something, our brain only looks for things that will verify that belief. So you only notice things that will work with or validate that belief that you have. Cognitive dissonance is a psychological term and that's what happens when you have a belief about something but you experience or you witness something that's very much against that belief or contrary to that belief and your cognitive dissonance is created. So then what your mind does is it tries to misinterpret it or minimize it or reinterpret it so that it fits your belief. And if it can't do that, then maybe it will shift your current belief to incorporate that new information. But that is really the last resort of our brain. This is why that whole idea of curiosity is such an important concept because it keeps our mind just a little bit open. It helps that cognitive dissonance not be such a painful arduous thing. Uh, it helps us keep our minds, like I said, open and, and aware of possibly the idea that maybe there's other information that we're really blocking out of ourselves. Um, one exercise that we can actually do right now that I'll do with some of my clients is if you can take a moment right now and just look around the room and look for all things red. Maybe even say it in your mind, the different things that have read that you see. Maybe it's on a book, maybe it's on cupboards, maybe it's in a painting, maybe it's in linens or on clothes, right? And just notice all the red, right? Now, close your eyes and after you imagine, that you remember all the things that you saw, right? And so with your eyes still closed, see if you can remember all the yellow. Look around in your mind <laughs> and now open your eyes and look around and see all the yellow. So notice the yellow may be in some logos, in different products. Again, now often, actually every single time I've done this with a client, with that second color, there's always so much more of it than they thought right? They didn't, when you look for red, you don't notice yellow. You only see red and red becomes your whole existence. That's how stereotypes work. That's how others being a reflection of our thoughts works. Because if we think a certain thing, we will always look for ways that that thing is true. If I think that I am a certain way, I will look for truth or examples of that way. Now this can be really detrimental if I think negative things about myself. If I think I'm stupid, then I'm always going to be looking for things that prove that I'm stupid. And then my whole reality becomes 
this whole idea of, oh, I'm stupid. Let me see how I can avoid being stupid, right? But yellow was there. I can do this with any color. Actually, all colors exist in the world, not just red. And even though you think or you focus on looking at red, that doesn't mean you can't switch and shift and look for yellow, right? So that's the same as our own beliefs and our ideas. Just because we see things a certain way doesn't mean we can't shift and see things another way. And this is a really important concept in terms of want and don't want. When we always look for things we don't want, then our whole life becomes about don't want. As opposed to if we just go to the opposite and look for what we want, then our life becomes so much more full of joy and excitement and lightness and bliss. I have a video on want and don't want, so please watch that if you need more information on that. It's a really life-changing concept. So that's kind of the first way of how other people are a mirror. The world is a mirror of what our thoughts, beliefs, and focuses are all about. Okay, the second, my second interpretation of this is that we can't control what happens to us. I've worked with some extreme cases of survivors of torture, survivors of domestic violence, survivors of sexual violence, right? And they are never the ones responsible for the pain that they endured and went through, right? That is never their fault. It is always the perpetrator's responsibility to do or not do certain things, right? So we cannot control what people are going to do with us. We can't control what the earth is going to do. We can't control natural disasters. We can't even control wars often, unless you're one of those few very top people, right? And so, so much of our life is actually out of our control. However, we can always control the response we will have to someone else. Oftentimes I hear people talk about, oh, you made me so angry. I don't believe in that. I think someone can do whatever they want and I, they cannot take away my power and my, uh, yeah, decision over how I'm then going to react to what they did, right? So somebody can be a total jerk and poo head. <laughs> I've never said that word before. <laughs> I usually swear, um, right? And I can choose to let them ruin my day or not. That's my decision. However, I have to take responsibility for that decision. If I say, oh, they made me feel this way, then I'm giving up responsibility. And then that means I don't actually have control even of my own response. They have control over my life and the happiness of my life or the unhappiness of my life, which is tragic, right? I wanna be in control. So the double-edged sword is if I wanna be in control of my responses, I also have to take responsibility for the responses I've had. Now taking responsibility is a lot different than judging myself for the responses I've had. Many cases, especially in terms of sexual assault, um, survivors will feel guilty or like it's their fault, which is completely not true. Please, if you've ever experienced sexual assault, not even remotely your fault, even if it's happened to you multiple times, right? So guilt is a, is a very common reaction. To judge yourself for having guilt that's like, that's being hard on or violent to yourself, really, right? Any times of self-judgment, that's being very aggressive to yourself. And we do self-judgment to try and make ourselves a better person. But when you're already in pain, to then judge yourself for that pain is really inappropriate. That's the last thing you need. And that's the last uh, way that you will actually heal and become a better pe person. If you are in pain, then you need compassion and you need uh, witnessing, and you need companionship and connection, right? So always when I talk about being in control of your responses, try and choose responsive, responses that are loving and compassionate and kind, both to yourself and then when you're ready, maybe to other people. That's completely your decision. Um, I always say to my clients, I don't care what you decide, I just care how that like that you are making that decision consciously. I just care that you take responsibility for whatever decision you make. Personally, I don't even think there's a wrong decision. I just think we need to be aware and 
If I decide that I want to be depressed, which sometimes I do, that's no problem. I will stay depressed and I know as soon as I'm ready to kind of crawl out of that hole of depression, I know I can use gratitude and that will get me out. But sometimes I don't want to get out. I want to wallow and that's not a problem. That's okay. As long as I'm making that decision to do that. Okay. All right. So the third thing, third thing <laughs> is that we often like others are a mirror of ourselves because they reflect and they show us the judgments that maybe we don't even realize we have about ourselves. Um, the best example is unconscious limiting beliefs. I've created a video on that if you want to watch that because it's really important. Um, but it really shows how when we get super annoyed or super angry with somebody, although that's completely their fault, if it's triggering an overreaction in us, then it's a really good hint or it's a really good um, nudge that maybe it's because it, it triggered a wound or it's showing us a wound, right? So people are, uh, there's this concept of everyone's a teacher or these people that you don't get along with are teachers. And they're teachers because they show us what we need to still heal in ourselves, what we still need to process, what we still need to integrate and bring home. And without other people actually as a mirror to ourselves, it's often very difficult to know what those things are. So that's the gift of other people. It's also the pain, but it's the gift. And especially in personal relationships or romantic relationships, when they're very close to our heart, it can really show us different insecurities that we have, which is a beautiful thing because you cannot heal something that you're not aware of. That's why they always say awareness is the biggest step because once you're aware, then you can decide or not decide if you want to take control and what responses you want to have to that. But you cannot decide that unless you are aware of it. So I find like other people as a mirror is just it's such a wonderful opportunity, even when I'm pulling my hair out in frustration, to really learn about some judgments that I didn't even realize I had or some wounds that I didn't even realize I had uh, that I can then heal. And then it really changes the interaction with that same person. It's an extremely beautiful thing. Okay, fourth. I see others people being a mirror of ourselves is also an expression of how we're all interconnected. Carl Jung has this philosophy of this collective unconscious. And there's been so many times in history where people in different parts of the world came up with the same idea. The idea of evolution was actually three different people came up with this idea at the same time. And, and Carl Jung explains that as there being this collective unconscious that once uh, there's a certain level of knowledge, then it gets dispersed to everybody. A similar concept is the hundred monkey rule or theory. And that's the idea that once a hundred monkeys learn a certain skill, then all monkeys around the world will automatically have that skill. Now, why is this important? For me, this is at the heart of so much that I do because if I work on myself and heal myself, that means I am contributing to the collective unconscious, to the consciousness of the world as a whole. And that's such a beautiful thing. If I'm able to help you think about or discover different wounds and help you heal them, then that's also exponentially making the world a better, more loving place. So often people feel like maybe they're being selfish or they shouldn't just look at themselves or healing themselves or loving themselves is self-centered. And no, I don't think so whatsoever. I think it's such a beautiful thing that when we heal ourselves, we also heal those we interact with. On a practical note, I think you really notice, you can feel this in families where if one family, each family member usually has a role. And if one person in the family changes or or does something different, every other family member will try and get that person to come back. That's why maybe at uh, holidays or something, when all the family comes together, everybody kind of feels like they're 
11 again or <laughs> 14 again, right? Because your family members have this view of you and they put you into that role and then you start actually acting that role, right? But then if we're all a reflection and we can do our own work and help other people like be a better person so that other people also have the space to do their own work, right? When you shine bright, you give the permission for other people to shine bright and reach their fullest potential. And that is such a beautiful, um, ah, I just think that's such a beautiful way that life works and, and a beautiful way to see others as a mirror of ourselves. So the more loving to ourselves that we become, the more loving we will see other people being towards us and each other. So that's why I love psychology so much because for me, this is my way of trying to um, achieve world peace, if you will. I know it's a goal that will never, probably never be attained, but it's something that I always want to try and strive for, regardless of the outcome. So I'll just finish with this one quote that really came at a, a perfect moment in my life, and it's by Bertha von Suttner, and she was the second woman to win a Nobel Peace Prize in 1905. And I have this magnet of her and this quote on my fridge. And the quote is, seek not good from without, seek it within yourselves or you will never find it. And this I think is a fantastic summary of how others are a mirror of ourselves. Thank you so much for sticking in here. Let me know uh, what your thoughts are or if you have other ideas of how this applies to your life in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe down below. Take care.